Wake up, Kino. Eighteen minutes, thirteen seconds, four frames. That is when the video ends. Who is Donnie Darko? Is he a time traveler, a superhero, a lucid dreamer, or is he just a disturbed kid? What about him resonated so much with audiences? How come we can look at Donnie, a boy who destroyed his school's water main, set fire to a pervert's house, and created a time portal in order to destroy the Tangent Universe and save the main universe? Not to mention the fact that Donnie has a spooky rabbit friend who is like a ghost traveling back in time in order to speak to him. How can we look at all of this and then, with no hint of irony, say, wow, he's literally me? We'll get to all that in due time, but first, I want to point out how it's a miracle that Donnie Darko even got made. So I got a girlfriend this week. 3D or 2D? 2D. Richard Kelly, the writer and director, wrote the film when he was only 23. It was his first major script and it was kind of a Hail Mary for him, as he was freshly out of film school and needed to do something bold to pursue his dream of directing and bold is certainly the correct term for Donnie Darko. The script made its way around Hollywood, wowing people while also confusing them. It was a script unlike anything they had ever read, but even though it was a movie script, they saw it as a great writing sample from a promising young voice, but nothing more. It got him some work, such as writing the script for the Disney film Holes. He fumbled that gig though, as his version of Holes was dark and weird and I think set in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. According to him, the Disney execs were baffled when they read his script and promptly fired him from the project. But as luck would have it, a director you all probably have never heard of as he's super obscure, Wes Anderson, released his sophomore film Rushmore to critical and popular acclaim. That film revived Bill Murray's career and made Jason Schwartzman a star. So after the release of Rushmore, Schwartzman was looking for his next big project, and he just so happened to get his hands on a copy of the script for Donnie Darko. He loved it and wanted to play as the titular character, so he officially attached himself to the project and, in doing so, rescued the film from forever being seen as merely a neat writing sample. You might be saying, but Jason isn't in this movie. Didn't the deal fall through? Yes, it did. But it brought new eyes to the script because people loved Rushmore, and let's face it, everyone loved Jason Schwartzman. Why are you wearing that stupid bunny suit? My mom made me. Sponsor time. The company I work for, Fudo, is now accepting applications to be part of our 2023 fellowship program. We're looking for people with cool, world-changing tech projects. If you're accepted, you'll stand to make at least $20,000 per engineer. You'll get office space in our new campus, accommodation, connections, and much more. We only ask that your project is open source, not based on a business model in which you sell customers' data to corporations or governments, and that you have a plan to not sell out. If this sounds interesting to you, I'll leave a link to the application page in the description below. Now, back to the video. Two big fans of Rushmore and Jason were the producers of Flower Films, Nancy Juvonen and Drew Barrymore. Yes, the Drew Barrymore who stars my favorite movie to watch when I'm in an airplane, 50 First Dates. Don't judge me. Nancy obtained a copy of the script and gave another to Barrymore. They both fell in love with the project and came on board as producers, raising four and a half million dollars for the film based on Barrymore's name alone. I'd say she earned her role as the cool English teacher. Barrymore was so enthusiastic about the project that Schwartzman dropping out didn't deter her. Richard Kelly said that Schwartzman left because of scheduling conflicts, but also he was having doubts about whether or not he was the right fit for the role. His departure allowed them to find Jake Gyllenhaal, who is so perfect as Donnie that I can't even imagine anyone else as that character. Now that they had a cast, a bit of money, and a whole lot of balls, or perhaps just youthful ambition, the team set out to bring Richard Kelly's dreams to the silver screen, not knowing how culturally important their little sci-fi film would later become. Common questions I hear about Donnie Darko are, what the hell was that about? What does it mean? And what exactly happened? I want to read a quote from Jake Gyllenhaal from his section in the Donnie Darko book. What is Donnie Darko about? I have no idea, at least not a conscious one, but somehow I've always understood it. The most amazing thing about making this movie for me was the fact that no one, including the man from whose mind it emerged, ever had a simple answer to this question. And that, ironically, is the very thing the film is about. There is no single answer to any question. 
I think that this film allows for multiple interpretations. You can see the film as a dream, as a sci-fi, or as a teen drama about mental illness, among many other things. What I want to illustrate here in this video is how the director, Richard Kelly, views the movie. That's not to say that his perspective is the only correct perspective, but I think it's an interesting interpretation to know. You're free to agree or disagree with it. First and foremost, Donnie Darko is a time travel movie, but Kelly jettisoned actual theory on how time travel might work in favor of what he called a comic book kind of logic. He outlined this logic in The Philosophy of Time Travel, which is the book in the film that Grandma Death wrote and which Donnie reads. Don't try finding a full copy of the book, as it doesn't exist. But what Kelly did write is available online. So let's break it all down. The movie opens with Donnie waking up on a mountain road overlooking Middlesex establishing the fact that he sleepwalks. Well, more than sleepwalks, as he obviously rode his bike up to this spot. Perhaps he has an alter ego when he's asleep, or maybe his body is being manipulated by some outside force. Later that night, we enter the Tangent Universe. The TV goes to static, with a 1950s recording of the national anthem playing through the speakers. Frank lures Donnie out of the house and onto a golf course, warning Donnie of a coming apocalypse. That is when the world Will end. And Elizabeth arrives home from her date. Then, a jet engine falls onto the Darko household. It goes right through Donnie's bedroom. Donnie wakes up the next day on the golf course, greeted by Jim Cunningham, the local self help celebrity. Ominously inscribed on Donnie's arm is 2806 12. How long he has before the world ends. The clock is ticking and Donnie has to restore order, but how? There are four concepts that Kelly outlines in his writing, that of the manipulated living, the manipulated dead, the living receiver, and the insurance trap. The manipulated living can be anyone, really. Obviously, Donnie is being manipulated to do certain things, but other characters are manipulated by some greater force so that they might serve as guides to Donnie, such as when Professor Monotov teaches Donnie about time travel and gives him the book, The Philosophy of Time Travel. The manipulated dead is what it sounds like, dead people being manipulated for the same purpose of saving the universe. In this case, Frank is the manipulated dead, as Donnie Wait, I have to say this. Spoiler alert. Now nah, you can't be mad if I ruin the film for you. Shoots Frank in the eye near the end of the film. In the film's logic, this basically turns Frank into a ghost and he can move through time as he's not constrained by his body. So he's being used as a messenger from aliens, God, or whoever else to lead Donnie down the correct path. That leaves us with the living receiver, who is obviously Donnie Darko, the person chosen to correct this glitch in the universe. Frank appears to him and only him, and the fate of the world rests on his shoulders. Donnie's mission is to create the correct conditions so that he can create a time portal that rips off the engine of the airplane and sends it crashing into his house, in effect nullifying the tangent universe and bringing order back to the world. This is why he destroys the school's water main and burns down Jim Cunningham's house. They pave the way for creating the right conditions so that Donnie can create the time portal at the end of the movie. In the case of the house fire, it ensures that Donnie's mom will be on the plane. As the living receiver, Donnie has superpowers. They're not as noticeable as superpowers we'd see in a Marvel movie. He doesn't swing from webs or have metal spikes come out of his hands or anything, but the powers are still there. Judging by the axe and the bronze school statue, he's got some kind of heightened strength, at least when he's asleep. Also, as the apocalypse nears, the barriers between whoever is guiding Donnie and Donnie dissipate. Frank no longer stands behind a wall of water. Instead, Frank takes off his bunny mask at Donnie's request revealing himself to be Elizabeth's boyfriend, albeit he is missing an eye. And yes, Frank is the boyfriend of Donnie's big sister. We see his red car at the beginning of the film, and we hear him honking, potentially in an effort to wake Donnie up and save him, right before the jet engine hits the house. Getting back to Donnie, as the barriers melt away, his powers grow. He gains the ability to manipulate water, and he can see water-like tubes coming out of people's chests, showing their future paths, which calls into question whether or not anyone in this universe at least, has any free will? Are they all manipulated, like NPCs in a video game? Since Donnie can see his path, does that mean he has the ability to go against fate? Is Donnie the only truly awake person here? But because Donnie might have free will, he might have the ability to decide not to save the universe. That's why there's an insurance trap, which is a situation that gives Donnie no choice but to create the portal and send back the artifact. 
in this case the engine, to the primary universe. The insurance trap happens at Grandma Death's house. That's where the two bullies jump Donnie and his girlfriend. Frank, swerving to miss Grandma Death, runs over Gretchen with his car, and in retaliation, Donnie shoots Frank in the eye. At this point, all is lost for Donnie. The only way to make things right is to go up to the mountain and do what must be done. As he heads up to the mountains, we hear the same patriotic music from the TV that we heard when the universe is split at the beginning of the film, signaling the fact that this is the moment to save the world. It's now or never. At the end, after he creates the time portal and sends the artifact into the primary universe, Donnie wakes up laughing. Why? Was it because he was enlightened by his journey in the tangent universe? Or was it because he thought it was all some ultra-realistic lucid dream? I guess that's up for you to decide. With Donnie's sacrifice, everyone returns to the primary universe, thinking of the tangent universe as merely a dream. Very soon, they'll all forget about it. That's why Gretchen, when passing by Donnie's ruined house at the end of the film, feels a sense of deja vu, a weird and fading connection to the Darkos. Somewhere, some time ago, she knew them, but not anymore. And thus Donnie, the savior of the universe, will fade away into obscurity, remembered only as the boy who died in an unexplainable freak accident. I see Donnie Darko in the philosophy of time travel as being like an encrypted message and a decoder, with the text making sense of the film. Sure, there are plot holes and paradoxes, but that just comes with the territory with time travel movies. They're always going to be a bit messy. As much as Donnie Darko puzzled audiences and sent many a fan down many rabbit holes to make sense of the film, I don't think that it's complicated or, one can argue, convoluted sci-fi story is what made it a classic. What made it a classic were its characters. Eddie Darko has this amazingly goofy and endearing boomer dad energy. His wife Rose loves her wine, probably on account of Donnie, and is both tender and sarcastic. We can tell both parents are confused and stressed about their situation and feel a sense of hopelessness about it all, but they continue on and do what they think is best for their kids. Kitty Farmer, an almost cliche, overly involved conservative mom, delivers one of the funniest lines in the movie and also serves as a well-meaning antagonist. I'll tell you what he said. He asked me to forcibly insert the lifeline exercise cart into my anus. <coughs> Patrick Swayze brings humanity to a self-help charlatan with a penchant for cheese pizza. Monotoff and Pomeroy are the two cool teachers you either always remember or you wish you had. I could just list off all the characters here, but I don't think I need to. Why they work is because Kelly, while writing them, loved them. He's not trying to be mean-spirited towards any of them. It's pretty obvious that he feels a sense of warmth towards most, if not all, the characters, probably because he incorporated a lot of his own life into the script. These characters are people he knows and loves. And yet, they feel like people we know. If you grew up in suburban America, like I did and like Richard Kelly did, then you know people who are exactly like any one of these characters. By writing something personal, he created something universal. Even the fear and love curriculum is something I experienced in a Florida suburban school. Kelly said he ripped that bit straight from a class he had to take as a high school freshman. But I can recall at least a handful of those weird classes my elementary and middle school made me take, where they taught us about life goals or optimism or about not having premarital sex. Those all felt weird to me, which is why I always feel a sense of catharsis whenever Donnie just goes off during those classes. And that brings us to the best character in the film, Donnie Darko. It's actually amazing how Jake Gyllenhaal carries this film. The title of the movie is his name, and he's in almost every scene. He's also the character that people point to and say, oh wow, he's literally me. So what's his appeal? He's an edgy teenager from a normal, upper middle class household. He has a couple friends, but he's also a bit of a loner. He is a bit different than everyone else and doesn't really know why. In this case, he's relatable to a lot of young men. There's another layer though. As a very relatable protagonist, he does things that we might have never done, but maybe wished we had on some base level. Flooding the school to get days off, calling Jim Cunningham the Antichrist to his face in the middle of an assembly, burning down his house and thus bringing the hammer of justice down on him for having all that perverted material, having the new girl choose to be his girlfriend. His actions act as a kind of wish fulfillment for our edgy teenage selves who thought that creation through destruction was a cool idea. There's yet another layer to his character, and that is the mythological layer. Richard Kelly is a big fan of Joseph Campbell, and if you're aware of that, you can easily see how Donnie Darko is a Campbellian myth. The story of Donnie Darko is the hero's journey. Frank gives him the call to adventure, and Donnie is provided with supernatural aid. Throughout the film, he finds many guides and mentors who advance him on his heroic path and present him with challenges and quests. At the point of no return, 
he enters the cave, in this case Grandma Death's cellar door, to find the treasure, which is the knowledge that will help him save the world. Afterwards, he faces the abyss as he witnesses the death of his girlfriend and the death of Frank, his ultimate mentor by his own hands. The abyss forces him to transform into who he needs to be to save the world. It gives him the resolve to create the portal and sacrifice himself for the sake of humanity, cementing him as a Christ figure. His final act is not done because he likes being powerful or because he's forced to do it. He performs the final sacrifice, the sacrifice of himself, as an act of love. Love for his friends, family, enemies, and especially love for Gretchen. I want to point out that he learns how to control water throughout the course of the film. In the logic of the movie, water and metal are important elements for creating time portals. The director stated that he thought of metal as well as water because the plane engine was made of metal. But I think there's a slightly deeper meaning. Water is a symbol for chaos, whereas I think we can see metal as a symbol for order. Donnie, playing his role as mythic hero, must utilize both the forces of chaos and order to come to an adequate synthesis of the two. He must maintain, or actually restore, the balance. He's a normal kid who, through weird circumstances, is elevated to being a mythological hero. He's man and god at the same time, but he doesn't lose his humanity. He's still a kid who thinks way too much about sex and argues about Smurf's lore with his friends. That's the beauty of Donnie Darko. It's a relatable teen drama that follows a mythical storyline, all while being wrapped up in a Twilight Zone kind of story. Donnie Darko, though brilliant, had a troubled release. It polarized audiences at Sundance and worse. It didn't find any distribution there. It took four months to find a company to pick it up, and it required Christopher Nolan, of all people, to convince New Market Films to acquire Donnie Darko. Still, they didn't have any plans to actually put it in cinemas, but Drew Barrymore was able to convince them to play it in, like, 50 theaters nationwide, which is not a lot, but it is something. Over the course of this, though, the distributor had Kelly cut his movie down about seven or eight minutes. He also had to replace the opening song with a different, cheaper song, among other changes. The film, which released in October of 2001, initially bombed. Was it too weird? Was the marketing bad? Maybe American audiences weren't in the mood for that kind of story, considering 9-11 had just happened a month prior. The movie gained traction a year later through DVD sales and through UK cinemas. People in the UK loved the film. That love transferred back to the States, and the film became a cult classic. In the wake of its success, the distributor hired Kelly to create a director's cut, which released only a few years after the initial theatrical run. A lot of people consider the director's cut the superior version of the movie, but I think both versions are pretty special. While the director's cut makes more sense, the theatrical cut has more of a sense of mystery and leaves a bit more to the imagination. Although they have the same stories and same characters, there are enough differences between the two to make both of them worthwhile experiences. Which version of Donnie Darko do you prefer? Who's your favorite character in the film? What's your interpretation of the movie? Let me know in the comments down below. As always, I've been the Kino Corner, and I will see you all in the next video.